The voice of the drum calls. It sings a song of those who came before us and those to come. A song of survival and strength. A song of participation and voice. A song that calls us together. When we come together and participate in the 2010 census, we use this tool as the voice of all our native people. Our voice, it is in our hands, 2010 census. Welcome to this edition of the Native News Update on this Tuesday, March 23rd. I'm your host for today's program. And here's what we've got on this day, March 23rd, is the fifth anniversary of the passing of Lori Piestawa. And Lori was a mother of two young boys and a U.S. Army Quartermaster Corps soldier killed during the same Iraqi Army attack in which her friend Jessica Lynch was injured, a member of the Hopi tribe. Payestawa was the first woman in the U.S. Armed Forces killed in the 2003 Iraq War and is the first Native American woman to die in combat while serving with the U.S. military during modern times. Also today, uh, President Barack Obama signed a new bill uh, for national health care into law, and we go to our mastermind, Rovin Kaiser fellow Mark Trehant of the Shoshone Bannock tribe to talk just a little bit about this historic moment and what to expect in the next implementation process. Uh, welcome to the Native News Update, Mark Trehunt. Uh, you're going to give us a little bit of an idea of what happened here most recently in Washington, D.C., the passage of the what's going to be called o the Obama health care plan. And I, I felt for a little while talking to you that there was times when you almost wanted to say, Paul, it's dead. Oh, I thought it was dead uh, many, many times throughout this process, and I'm... Uh... I'm really glad to say I was wrong. I was absolutely wrong. This president had a commitment and the Speaker of the House and the Senate that went beyond the normal uh, give and take of politics. Uh, I, I think today, let me just get the headline, is uh, uh, not long ago the president in a White House ceremony used 11 pens to sign uh, health care reform into law. And what's most important for um, your viewers is that the Indian health care Improvement Act is part of that, and the president said it best when he said, we are done. It's now the law of the land. It's, it's quite phenomenal having watched the whole process for a piece of legislation like this, very, very controversial, uh, yet very, very needed, by uh, millions of people supporting it, but of course, uh, people's positions, you know, being very adverse to bring something together but just to watch the process, would you be able to actually tell us if you had 15 minutes, and we don't need to do it now, how that whole process worked from the time that was introduced to the time when we thought uh, you, you had enough not to filibuster and all that? Let's just say it would be a very messy chart. It would right. be a convoluted. Not down. very used very often. No. No, a number of the procedures, although a lot of them have been in various ways. It's just having so many on this one piece of legislation all at once. Indeed. What, what do we know about those provisions affecting American Indians? Where are they? There was two, uh, some people said there was two main pieces, something about an IHS HIV initiative and then the entire act itself. Do you know anything about what happened? Oh, sure. Um, I think the most important thing is, um, first of all, the symbolism of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. It says in pretty blunt language that the United States has an obligation to provide health care for American Indian and Alaska Natives. And uh, that puts the government on the record. Uh, there was a provision in the House bill that failed that actually went further than that and said um, that was done in exchange for land. And had that been a part of the bill, I think it actually would have been stronger because you could have then taken it to the courts and said, wait, this is a quid pro quo. We got paid. You got your land. We didn't get the health care. Let's litigate. Uh, so that was taken out. Um, nonetheless, I think it's pretty significant because it does say that this is a U.S. obligation. The second thing that I think is most important is that the law is now permanent. Uh, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act was originally passed in 1976. It then had to go through a 10-year cycle and then a reauthorization process. And then, of course, uh, just about 10 years ago it expired, and they weren't able to get the votes to reauthorize it. This time 
it's now like the Snyder Act, which is the primary act that governs uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, to an extent, IHS. It is now a permanent law. It does not have to be reauthorized. Well, that's good news. And within an act itself, did it? Did you see? Uh, had you had a chance to look at the that act to see what it what new kind of things it brings to the table? Well, and you mentioned the HIV. I think it's really important to note, though, and this is a um, pretty confusing part of the process, is that all legislation runs on two tracks. Uh, the first track is what's called authorizing legislation, and that's what this is. It allows the government to spend money in this area. And everything else will still have to go through appropriations. Right. So it's a huge framework that says th this is the idea of what we want to go into this, but it doesn't right. necessarily fund certain components of it. That's right. You still have to go through the authorizing com or the appropriations committee to get those different uh, pieces put into place. Uh, in addition to HIV, I think one of the most significant is the training dollars. If uh, I were a young person today thinking about a career and I had any interest in health, I would really be looking at the opportunities presented in this piece of legislation. Uh, it extends the possibility of uh, grants, scholarship grants for people who want to work with the IHS. It uh, opens up more training opportunities for tribal entities that contract for IHS services. Uh, I think under the right uh, circumstances and a good proposal, it could allow an American Indian Alaska Native Medical School to be funded. Uh, that would be great news if they could do that. You see anything anything else of very uh, significance in that bill besides the training and the permanency of it? I think the permanent. I think it's more symbolic than actual uh, nuts and bolts at this point. Uh, I think it does uh, set a course for the IHS to modernize, but uh, that'll come down to execution. Uh, how it goes about selling itself and telling, I mean, uh, Indian country how to get involved, I think is going to be really a crucial part of it. The execution now becomes key. One thing that's going to have to happen on all of this is the regulations are going to have to be written. For example, uh, the act uses the word quality. What does quality mean? I mean, you're going to actually have to define that in a code of law, uh, regulations, and uh, that's where the rubber will really uh, meet the road. So, in other words, it might be at this particular point we've had this huge absence of tribal input, and it seems to me in terms of the act going through, now is the time for tribal consuls and other people in the healthcare care uh, career profession to get on board to help define how those programs may be implemented and to push for the actual dollars that go with them to make them work. Absolutely. Uh, although I think tribes have been involved with the actual writing of the act, and IHS has been pretty um, out front trying to get that involvement. So, But I do think the regulations and getting that narrowed down is going to be critical, and uh, tribal input will be absolutely essential. Is there any possibility that I can get the other half of my teeth clean that I've been waiting for two and a half <laughs> years at the Indian Health Service Dental Clinic? Uh, that's a good question. They you know, did, one of the... Um, they did this half, but not that half. <laughs> <laughs> you better join the Facebook group and complain. I've been looking there. <laughs> one of the challenges I think that is going to be a pretty good deep conversation is, uh, is it in the interest of American Indians and Alaska Natives, even with this recognition of a treaty right, trust responsibility, to go out and purchase private insurance? And the argument on one side is that, no, this is an obligation of the United States. On the other side is, yeah, but do you really want service? Do you want your teeth cleaned? And the fact is, if you have private insurance and use IHS, you have more options than somebody who doesn't. And uh, nothing in this act is going to change that. So let, let's say, what are those options? The options are that if I have private insurance, if there's a long waiting list, I could go 11 miles to the local village and have some other person do it, and my insurance company gets charged and it's done and over with, and I'm not in a waiting line. Does that seem to be the major difference with that insurance, or do you think that insurance policy is going to get some attention at the Indian Health Service Clinic? I think the insurance policy will get some attention at the IHS clinic because they can bill that third party. Well, as we move along here, uh, we're going to keep an eye on how this thing is implemented. Uh, there are some adjustments and amendments that still, I believe, have to come through on the process. 
that right. may not be done. Uh, Obama signed the bill today. He did. He used 11 pens. It was a great ceremony. Uh, gonna, there were some tribal leaders in the audience. Good. We're going to come back to you for some more updates as we follow this whole thing along. Appreciate your time, Mark. Happy to do it. You take care. And that is the latest roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. Thanks for joining with us. Stop by again soon. Miigwech.